Welcome back. Um, the third panel will be uh, on the future of democracy and digital media, and we have a wonderful panel right here. I'm going to introduce, uh, well, the, the session is set up in a way um, to feature Ken Suzuki and his uh, work uh, in the past and at Smart News right now. And then we'll have two dis discussions mainly uh, to comment and respond to Ken's uh, presentation and questions. Uh, so let me first introduce uh, Ken Suzuki. He is CEO and co-founder of Smart News, the global leader redefining information and news discovery. Uh, his life story and his career uh, is really part of the presentation that he's going to make, so I will not reveal too much about him at this point, uh, except to say that he's one of the most um, innovative minds coming out of Japan, and his accomplishment in turning smart news into the, I think it's the second unicorn coming out of Japan, unicorn being a uh, um, private, privately held startup company valued at over US $1 billion. Okay. So Ken will present. And uh, for about 20, 30 minutes. Then we'll have comments from two of uh, the most distinguished colleagues of mine uh, at FSI who have spent decades writing about democracy in the world. Uh, we have Larry Diamond. He is the uh, William L. Clayton Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, the Moscow Senior Fellow in Global Democracy at the Freeman Spogger Institute for International Studies, uh, and other titles. Um, he's known as uh, Dr. Democracy or Mr. Democracy. Um, he has written widely on democracy in too many articles and books to list here. Uh, and his most recent book, Ill Wins, Saving Democracy from Russian Rage, Chinese Ambition, and American Complacency, has uh, also been translated into Japanese, uh, published last year, uh, the Japanese version was. Okay. And then we have Francis Fukuyama. He is the uh, Olivier Nomellini Senior Fellow at Stanford University's FSI. Uh, he's also a uh, faculty member of FSI Center on Democracy Development and the rule of law. He's also director of Stanford's uh, uh, Master's in International Policy. Um, since the widely read piece, The End of History and the Last Man, uh, Frank's uh, written broadly on issues surrounding democracy, political ideologies, social order, and international politics. And his latest book, Liberalism and Its Discontents, was published in English last year, and it's in the process of being Translated March, 15th. Into, March 15th is a publication day, so people watching in Japan uh, go to the store and buy their books, both of their books. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Ken, and he will speak for about 20, 25 minutes. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. And uh, my name is Ken Suzuki, a founder and CEO of Smart News. A smart News is a smart, smartphone app that gathers information from around the world and uses humans and algorithms and humans are algorithm to deliver quality information to the people. We launched Smart News 10 years ago in Japan, and it has been downloaded more than 50 million uh, worldwide. Now, here in the US, and Smart News is used by millions of people as a go-to app for news discovery. Uh, recently, uh, we received a global award at the Japan Startup Awards 2022, and this award is special to us because uh, it was given to us directly from the Japanese government. Uh, I'd like to introduce a unique feature of our product and related to today's theme of democracy named News from All Sides. You can swipe left to see liberal leaning articles on a topic and swipe right to see the conservative leaning articles on the same topic. Many American voters actually used, used this feature during the 2020 election. Let me show you a video of one example during this election. If you go to the election page, which is also what I spend most of my time doing, you can pick a candidate that you want to read about. Usually I read about Trump because I feel like good or bad, the news is a little more interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so usually I go on there and I use the little slider. Um, I usually either pick like a Democratic um, themed article or a Republican themed article because obviously they're really different tones mm -hmm. and I like to go back and forth and read both because I think then it lets me like make my own opinions more easily. 
Um, uh, I... Have you tried the so uh, slider feature? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've tried that. It's pretty interesting. It's interesting to see which sources, because like you can clearly see where the article came from in like the bottom left hand mm -hmm. um, of the preview. So it's inter interesting to see the filter filter out certain news sources mm -hmm. versus other people. Mm -hmm. um, it just, I guess, is fun to show or just see like the different leanings politically mm -hmm. of different like media outlets. Mm -hmm. So I, I have been using it. Uh, this is specially, specifically designed to give users a wide variety of perspectives on uh, political content. A lot of political content tends to be ideologically driven and the people tend to have a narrow viewpoint. <laughs> and why are we developing such a feature? Immediately after the 2016 election, Kai Magazine sounded the alarm with a cover that refers to the United States as a divided state. However, the US political division did not suddenly appear in 2016. As this chart shows, it was only the shocking presidential election that shined a spotlight on a problem that had been growing in the United States for the past two decades, according to Pew Research. In February 2016, in the middle of the 2016 presidential primaries, I started a road trip to pursue the essence of the issue. I visited various places in the US, especially are rural conservative towns that Japanese people do not usually go to, and talked to local people and asked how they deal with information and politics. Since then, so I have visited over 25 of 50 US states. What I found out is the reality of what is known as a biased intake of information, a filter bubble or echo chambers. The cable TV, radio, social media, and the other media that we were exposed to were so close to our own ideas so that, that so we became more and more polarized in our thinking. And even within small towns and families, there was a division. To solve this problem, news from all sides was designed to develop a function that would allow people to view information from a variety of perspectives. The person in the previous video is using it in a conversation between his parents and himself. As you know, America's so founding fathers preferred the term republic to democracy. But the value of democracy in America was rediscovered by a foreigner. Just as Alexa de Tocqueville, a French man, once traveled around the United States as a foreigner, he investigated American democracy and wrote a book about its greatness and limitations. I, as a person from another country, have witnessed democracy in America. I believe in its resilience and flexibility and hope to contribute to its future development. Now, U.S. presidential election has become the largest security breach of the world order. Freedom of speech is supposed to be the strength of democracy. But foreign countries have taken advantage of it and are accelerating their interference in the digital space. The security breach revealed in the 2016 and 2020 elections have been exported to the world as a vulnerability of democracy and the skepticism toward democracy is spreading. Foreign political powers may intentionally spread fake news through social media, or fake content may spread as an accidental internet meme. Now, so generative AI will increase this risk. ChatGTP, a recent hot topic, is based on a deep neural network technology called large language model. In this quadrant, on, a, so on the right top of this figure, such generative AI allows for the large scale generation of low quality content. And since 
current social media algorithm judge this quality first based on whether it is stimulating to users as an attention economy. They are not good at judging where, whether the content itself is trustworthy or accurate. Of course, the problem of such unreliable and inaccurate content is recognized. And detection of low quality content will eventually become partially solved through technology. For example, how about making it mandatory for platforms to include an algorithm that puts an electronic watermark in text or images to prove that they are machine generated? On the other hand, what is essentially important is the generation of quality content on the right top of the disfigure. This is the most difficult part, but it must be solved. One of the reasons this is so difficult is that it's becoming harder and harder to pay for the generation of quality content. News Desert refers to the growing number of areas in the United States where there are no local newspapers. This is happening because of the rise of the internet has made the newspaper business model unworkable. Since 2005, 2,500 daily and weekly newspapers have already closed. And today, there are fewer than 6,500. That means two newspapers are disappearing every single week. According to Northwestern University study, 70 million Americans living in areas are without enough local news to sustain democracy. It has been noted that if local newspapers that provide local news disappear, voter turnout will decline, corruption will accelerate, and fake news will spread. Thus, the generation of quality content is essential for sustainability of democracy. Although we are a startup, we recognize the importance of this ecosystem and have adapted a system that returns the revenue to providers of quality content. It is difficult, but we need an ecosystem in which they are incentivized to create high quality content. Yes, democracy is at stake, but I believe technology can be used for the good of society. We must not neglect our efforts to achieve this. Technology is not putting democracy in jeopardy, but we need to deal with it well so that human beings are not swallowed up by technology. The Smartness mission is delivering the world quality information to the people who need it. This has not changed since our founding. We do not just deliver information. We must deliver quality information. But what is quality information? We often use the metaphor of the well, uh, healthy food. Junk food is full of sugar and tastes good. But if you eat as much as you want, you will damage your health. You have to think about the body and take a balanced and healthy meal. The same should be true uh, for information, which is nutrition. Uh, for your brain. This is our definition of, uh, of quality information. But social media is designed to get people addicted with doom scrolling that allows people to browse the negative content forever and the reaction buttons that stimulate the need for approval. Social media addiction is said to be more difficult to treat than alcoholism or drug addiction. If we continue to view only the information we want to see, we will damage our mental health, fall into fitter bubbles and echo chambers, and personal well-being will not be realized. We hope to change such a way of information intake and realize a world in which each individual has access to quality information. In order to solve the problem of democracy in the short term, 
it is important to support the generation and distribution of quality information from a variety of perspectives I have discussed. On the other hand, my start starting point before Smart News was actually a research project to envision society 300 years from now. How do you think democracy will evolve in 300 years? Let me tell you a little about my origins. I was born in 1975, and the Cold War rivalry between the US and the Soviet Union remains a vivid memory from my childhood. When I was a middle school a student at the Japanese school in Dusseldorf, West Germany, I once entered East Berlin on a school excursion. Five months later, Berlin Wall suddenly fell and Germany became one country. At the time, I felt naive and uncomfortable with the way the boundary was drawn in this world. It became a powerful original expense and influenced my life as a researcher. After studying physics through undergrad school, I completed my PhD in a complex systems and artificial life and pursued the various interdisciplinary studies. And just 10 years ago, and I published a book titled Namelakana, Society and Its Enemies. This book is meant to be thought provoking. It posed a challenging question to readers 300 years from now. How is it possible to live in this complex world as it is complex? Let me explain that, uh, what that means. For human beings, it is too difficult to accept this complex world as it is complex. This is because humans have cognitive limitations. If human, humans were capable of unlimited processing of all vast amount of information, we might be able to handle a complex world as it is complex. However, when we are using the finite resource of brain, we are limited in our cognitive abilities. We cannot understand the world perfectly as it is complex. And if we cannot understand it, we cannot deal with it. However, the advent of the internet and computers offer a life history opportunity to increase this cognitive and coping capacity by orders of magnitude. I wondered if we could use these information technologies to design a society that would allow us to live in a complex world in a complex way. And in this book, I propose four new social systems, a currency system, a voting system, a legal system, and a military system. Today, let me uh, introduce two of them. The first one is so individual democracy. Modern individualism defined the nation and the state as a static relationship and assumed that a citizen has a membership in one country. What if uh, you had a small stake in a different country or region, and you could be a small voter there. Conversely, what if we were to have a democratic dimension making across multiple countries, as in a governance of a large river crossing several countries? We can think of the voting system that is dynamic, and where, uh, where voters, uh, votes are propagated by multiple delegations like Twitter's photo social graph. This is called digital democracy because this aims for changing our way of thinking about consistent individuals. The second is constru constructive social contract. The concept of a social contract is a political theory that provides a basis for the establishment of the modern nation state. However, few people have the experience of actually concluding a social contract. The 41 passengers of Mayflower bounded for New England in the US created a Plymouth colony by signing a famous Mayflower compact. 
it is considered a historical example of the social contract. And it was described by the Tocqueville as the origin of the democracy in America. And it's now the origin of the modern global democracy. But what if technologies such as smart contracts could actually create social contracts, and not just roughly as a Mayflower compact, but on a more granular basis? I first proposed this idea as a constructive social contract in 2005, and 18 years have passed. The technological foundations for its realizations are gradually being put in place. One of my friends is trying to create a small community in a village in an Oita prefecture in Japan, where residents make decisions with smart contracts. All of these participants are going to be able to write smart contracts by Solidity programming language. Doesn't this remind you of a polymer's colony 400 years ago? It is important to talk about big issues like the presidential election but it is small, small steps that happen on the frontier, like those of the Primus colony 400 years ago, that make history happen. Innovation is made possible by living simultaneously in the here and now and 300 years into the future. And looking back 300 years into the present, you will be amazed at how simply people today see things. Today, it is a great honor for me to have this opportunity to talk with Raleigh Diamond and Francis Fukuyama, and uh, who have greatly influenced my research interest. So to conclude this presentation, let me ask both of you three open questions. Number one, what can technology do to heal the division of America? The news from all sides that smart news is now providing will not be enough to resolve the division in America. <coughs> we need to create empathy in a scalable way to bridge the distrust between divided people. If you have an idea you'd like to see implemented in smart news or any other services, I'd, li I'd like to hear your suggestions. Number two, can we update democracy through technology? I see that people like Glenn Weil, Vitalik, and Audrey Tan in the Web3 community have started a radical exchange movement. The proposals, such as the quadratic voting, are very interesting. But what are your thoughts on any attempts to fundamentally update democracy through technology? Is technology bad for democracy? Or is this a great opportunity for the future of democracy? Number three, even in a democracy recession, where can we find the frontiers of democracy? We will need a frontier like the Primus colony. It could be a metaverse or DAO or Mars colony. But it does not not necessarily have to be the technology driven. It could be a village somewhere in the developed country or a region in a developing country. Where can positive experiments on update of democracy take place? These are three open questions. I'm eager to hear your opinions on. Thank you for listening. Wonderful, thank you, Ken, for this stimulating presentation. Um, so my job as the moderator here is to get out of the way as much as possible and let the three brilliant minds uh, who have thought about democracy for, for decades um, do their magic. Um, so uh, let's get right into the discussion and I'd like to get uh, some reaction to the presentation and we can probably also get into at least the first question in, uh, you can integrate your response to um, one of those questions uh, in your comments. Uh, we'll start with Larry. Or Frank. Frank? Yeah. Oh, me? Okay. Okay, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you. Well, so, uh, Mr. Suzuki, that was really uh, uh, fascinating. Uh, we had lunch last week, and I 
downloaded Smart News, and I've been playing with it ever since. And so <laughs> I think I have a lot of comments on it, and uh, I think it's a really um, uh, extremely innovative and interesting app, and I think it has a lot of promise, and it actually fits with some of the ideas that we've had about how to deal with some of the political problems of democracy. So I, if you haven't done it already, I urge you to uh, uh, get that on your phone. Uh, I'm going to skip over the first question about what technology can do to heal the division in America, because I have no idea. Uh, I think that's a really tough question. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, number two and maybe number three. Uh, so the relationship of technology over the last, let's say, since the 1990s with the privatization of the internet has been very complicated. Uh, the trajectory overall that I think all of you recognize uh, is that back when the internet was first privatized, everybody thought this would be a great boon for democracy because information was a form of power and to the degree that you could make information free and easy to access, you would spread power out and therefore it would be a liberation technology, which is the name of a project that Larry was running for uh, a number of years. Uh, and then we found out that several things went wrong with that scenario. Uh, for one thing, um, people that didn't like democracy also figured out how to use the internet and to weaponize it and use it to undermine uh, people's um, confidence in democracy. But there's another process internal to the development of technology that I think undercut its pro uh, pro promise. Uh, so the idea was that technology was going to spread power out, but network economies and other kinds of economies of scale ended up concentrating power in exactly the opposite way. Now in China, that concentration of power has come under the control of the government and the Chinese Communist Party, uh, but in the United States, it's come under the control of these very large uh, internet platforms. And the kind of power that is exercised is, you know, is, uh, you know, it's complex. So it doesn't exactly uh, destroy freedom of speech, but it introduces power into whose speech, you know, gets broadcast and whose speech is paid attention to. And I think one of the big problems is that the platforms that have onto which the responsibility for uh, regulating speech content has fallen are basically private companies whose motivations are, uh, you know, their bottom line, uh, their profit making uh, companies. They don't see their main role as a protection of democratic values and therefore it's been misused uh, as Mr. Suzuki has pointed out in, uh, in quite a number of ways. And it's the concentration of power that I think should worry people that want to think about the relationship between technology and democracy. Uh, I think, what is it, this is 23 now, so it was two and a half years ago, I, I chaired a Stanford working group. We have a project on the uh, democracy and the internet, but I chaired a working group on platform scale, and as we started to think through the problem, uh, you know, most people that think about large scale technology platforms are in the antitrust world and mm -hmm. they're primarily worried about economic concentrations of power. Mm -hmm. uh, and our antitrust law, the way it's evolved, is entirely uh, meant to deal with economic harms that are caused by large scale. But as we started thinking through what this means for democracy, we began to realize that the real problem, I mean, that's a problem because concentrated wealth gives you concentrated power, but there was a problem beyond that, which really had to do, in a sense, with the reach that the, pro, uh, that the platforms had and their ability to both amplify certain messages and to take down others. Uh, and the criteria they used were um, not always ones that aligned with you know, democratic uh, values. Um, actually, Elon Musk, who I think has played a very unhelpful role in the last few months, the one thing he said that was correct was that freedom of speech doesn't necessarily uh, equate to freedom of reach. And what the platforms can do is vastly expand the reach of certain types of speech, uh, speech from certain people, so that 
in theory, everybody has a right to say whatever they want, but not everybody's speech gets amplified. And I think a lot of malign social actors have seen that as an opportunity and you know, used it to bad effect. And so part of the reason for the polarization that was pointed to was that you know, a lot of the content that gets the most uh, uh, you know, hits and, and retweets and so forth is polarizing content because nobody wants to you know, amplify boring, centrist, you know, wise, you know, uh, uh, interesting, um, but conventional speech. They want to, uh, you know, go after things that are extreme or, you know, conspiratorial and the like, and that's part of the source of that polarization. So the problem for democracy is that concentrated power. By the way, takedowns are the, the reverse side of that because the platforms also have the power to either shadow ban or ban altogether you know, certain other voices. So it's both the ability to amplify at a scale that is unprecedented in human history, right? The printing press you know, in Europe, in a certain part of Europe, spread information very broadly at the beginning of the 16th century. The internet spreads it everywhere globally. And mm -hmm. so this is a problem not just for American democracy, but uh, democracy everywhere. And it's that concentrated power to amplify or to silence that is really problematic. And so when I think about updating democracy by technology, uh, it may require the reverse or sort of updating technology by democracy yeah. because I think that technology by itself is never you know, fully ever solved any set of human problems. It's only to the extent that our political systems and institutions can guide the technology and use it for socially uh, beneficial purposes that technology actually ever manages uh, to solve anything. If you don't believe that, just think about global warming and pollution and you know, all of the other things that are produced by industrial civilizations. And if you didn't have a regulatory system that tried to get that under control, uh, we'd be living in one of these you know, uh, science fiction dystopias already, uh, given the power of, of uh, a modern industrial civilization to undermine its own premises for existing. And so I think that the real task then is to figure out how to make those platforms less powerful in their ability to silence and amplify. So that's why that brings us to smart news because it does have this feature uh, that, was, uh, that, that you saw where you can swipe, you know, depending on the way that uh, you want to see the news filtered. And this is actually very similar to the idea that we came up with in our uh, platform scale uh, committee. Uh, we proposed something we called middleware mm. in which you would outsource the ability to moderate content. No, so if you think about Twitter, Google, Facebook right now, they all have algorithms that determine what's going to get amplified and what's going to get silenced. And you have no idea what goes into that algorithm. Right? That's one of their big trade secrets. They're not going to let you know why you're being served certain ads and, and not others. And you know, that in itself takes away your agency. And so if you have the ability to actually say, well, I want to see what the Republican view of this particular incident is, or I want to see the Democratic view, that's good because that's returning agency to the individual user who should have had it in the first place. And, you know, was willing to give it up because it was so convenient to get you know all this stuff on your on your smartphone. Our idea was a little bit broader than what Smart News has done because we had this idea that you should have a whole kind of ecosystem yeah. of content mod, uh, moderators, uh, and you would have to do this through regulation because the platforms wouldn't give up this uh, this power voluntarily. But if you could make make it mandatory that every user of an internet service, of an internet platform, could actually choose uh, what kind of content moderation they wanted. That's the equivalent of picking on smart news, you know, what kind of news feed you want to see. But it could be broader than just liberal and conservative. You know, you could say, we want to see advertisements only from made in America, you know, products, or we want to see environmentally friendly, you know, uh, information. But to the extent that a user could actually tailor uh, what it is that came across their feed uh, and have and regain control over that, that would be good and that would decrease the ability to 
have a big platform make all of the decisions for you in a non-transparent way. Uh, and uh, that's good. Now, I think that uh, as we were talking about this, there's still a lot of problems because you don't want uh, unlimited choice in the way that your content is moderated. So, you know, you don't want to have a content filter that will say, find me the best child pornography on the internet, right? You don't want a, 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 a curator that will say, get me the most efficient bomb making, you know, videos that are out there, right? So there have to be certain actual standards. And this is why you know, Elon Musk, when he began his takeover of Twitter saying that he was a free speech absolutist, that in itself just made it obvious that he didn't know what he was talking about because you cannot have free speech absolutism on the internet. You know, there are certain social values that are so, uh, you know, uh, endangered by stuff that is out there that there has to be, you know, a certain base level of, uh, of content moderation. But in terms of political speech, uh, you get into these freedom of speech issues where it's not clear where the, you know, there's no social agreement on what the boundaries of acceptable speech are. But that's, a, that's an issue that I suspect Spark News still has to contend with. We were, we were talking about this at lunch. Mm. So if you have people that are denying the efficacy of vaccines uh, in the middle of a pandemic, right, is that considered out of bounds or is that, you know, an exercise of free speech that should be uh, permitted. And, uh, you know, I think that's a, that's a question that actually would have been answered differently two years ago uh, than it would be now, because I think actually now it's been recognized that, you know, the CDC wasn't always right about masking and, you know, certain of the guidance that they gave and opinion about that has changed because the science itself has changed. But that's an extremely difficult choice for any platform and any content moderator uh, to make. Uh, so, so I guess that's you know the way I think about it, that technology by itself, uh, it needs to interact with democratic institutions such that it actually fulfills the, pr the promise that it had, which is to actually empower you know, kind of ordinary people, uh, every individual, give them back uh, the freedom of choice that has been taken away by the way that power has concentrated in the hands of a relatively few private, you know, corporations headquartered a few kilometers from where <laughs> we sit. Great. Um, well, uh, I definitely uh, agree with what Frank has said with his perspective. And I also applaud the work of Ken Suzuki in this uh, extremely innovative and I think um, promising platform, I'd see, even say visionary. Um, although um, this is probably not a subject to be discussed on this panel, but um, I, I hope you're being commercially successful. <laughs> um, you know, the core problem is the one or a, certainly a core problem is the one that Frank has uh, mentioned, that the, uh, the business model of social media is deeply destructive uh, and um, socially and democratically harmful. Uh, and just so that everybody in this room leaves this room understanding exactly what that is, I want to take 60 seconds to spell it out. Um, most uh, social media companies um, derive their uh, revenue uh, from either, uh, well, bo probably both of two things, um, uh, collecting data and commercializing the data uh, of the users and selling ads both the sale of the ads and the commercialization of the data, uh, the revenue rises as people spend more time on the platforms. So from, you know, since the beginning, uh, the uh, purpose has been, how do you get people to spend more time on your platform? And what these social media companies uh, no, uh, probably knew from the start 
but have been able to fine tune in part by hiring a lot of very smart behavioral scientists who helped to shape the algorithms is that the more you can get people to invest emotion, and particularly anger, outrage, shock, surprise, uh, and militant, um, deeply emotionally invested engagement with the platform, the more people will spend time on the platform and the more money the social media companies will, will make. Therefore, um, the social media companies have an enormous um, commercial uh, and pecuniary interest in feeding content, whether it's Facebook or YouTube or uh, whatever it might be, feeding and elevating content to their users that provokes shock, outrage, uh, and anger, and greater, more militant, and even conspiracy theory, theorizing conviction about something, the opposite of what you're trying to do by uh, giving them uh, more uh, revenue. So I want to speak to the first uh, issue of what technology can do to heal uh, our divisions. Uh, but I want to begin by making some comments about what we need to do to technology or um, what we need to do to regulate and restrain technology and technology corporations. Uh, because unless you change the business model, um, I don't think we can get a handle on this. Uh, and I believe this is going to require far more reaching, aggressive regulation of the social media companies than most people are willing to consider. I think we need, at least need a very serious debate about whether Section 230 immunity for these social media companies should be lifted. There's now, of course, a, a court case that's probably going to wind up in the US Supreme Court uh, about this uh, that involves a lawsuit against, what is it, against Google um, for the harm it did uh, that led to, I think, uh, the allegation uh, that it led to um, uh, the suicide of a, a young girl who was driven to um, that's another problem, by the way. It's not just po polarization, but all of the mental health harm that's being inflicted um, by these social media companies. In any case, so um, be before I get to the technology innovation side of it, um, I want to say we need more uh, legal and regulatory action uh, to get at a minimum uh, what my colleague here in the law school, Nate personally, has proposed uh, transparency in the algorithms mm -hmm. that the social media companies are using and the ability of qualified social scientists to get at them, analyze them, uh, understand their internal logic and their consequences. The second thing is, um, I wonder if you've thought about this, Ken. You've got a great product. How do you persuade people to use it? I'm sure you're thinking about that. But I'm thinking about it not just in terms of advertising your product. I'm thinking about how do you socialize uh, social media users? And really, if we're talking about socialization, we should be talking about from a very early age to want to spread that dial around and get multiple points of view. And to know that they, if they don't do that, they are being fed and manipulated into a personally and civically and democratically extremely dangerous dynamic. Uh, and in this regard, I think, again, this is not really about technology. We need a whole new generation, not only for the United States, I'd say for, for every open society of civic education that gets young people to question the core <laughs> phenomenon of civic education, skepticism, inquiry, rational debate, and again, moving the dial around to get multiple perspectives. 
So there is a really marvelous initiative here that's gotten um, traction um, from the School of Education, about you know a five-minute walk from here, uh, and something called um, uh, I think it's the Social Science History Education Group uh, at the School of Education, led by uh, Sam Weinberg, uh, professor of education, and Joel Breakstone, who d directs the um, the program, and they're simply trying to get, uh, it's a curriculum. It's not complicated, it's fairly easy to do, uh, that begins to get young people from a very early age to question <laughs> what they see on these platforms and break out of that downward uh, pillar of um, narrow information, and eventually from narrow information it's not a very long um, journey until you get to disinformation to step outside and question and search around and see what else there is. I mean, you've got an app and a dial that can enable people to do that automatically and get exposed to, to diverse um, points of view. So that's the second thing I wanted to say, that I think we really uh, need... Um, civic education uh, to prepare young people to want to use the kind of tools that you're offering. The third thing I want to say, I won't dwell on it here, is we're not going to get to healing the divisions uh, in this democracy without, I think, quite dramatic uh, institutional reform. Because the incentives, now, the, the Congress, you, you showed the um, uh, the separation, I use that slide too, in American public yeah. opinion, uh, with the public separating, so we see left and less and less overlap between left and right in public opinion. I've got another slide that I show in, the, in, in my class that shows the separation in terms of the distributions of left and right, Republican and Democrat, in the U.S. Congress. Hmm. And when you look at the distributions of Democratic and Republican-leaning Republican -leaning members of the public, you see the separation and the reduction in overlap, but the overlap hasn't disappeared. In the United States Congress, it's gone completely, zero. And the reason why is because of the electoral incentives in the United States, the interaction of the current system, in my opinion. Uh, you don't have this uh, in Japan. Uh, you've got, I think, at least a somewhat better electoral system there with the PR component. But in the US, the combination of... Um, I that. Could you try again? <laughs> is that me or you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea who's speaking. Uh, in any case, I don't think it's me. Um, <laughs> Somebody's got an iPhone that is, at, well, this is another problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> social media has a mind of its own. So um, I think in this regard, um, we need very significant institutional reform uh, of the incentive structures that confront our politicians as well as our social media companies. Now, there is uh, another uh, innovation on campus here, and it is in a little bit a technological innovation that I think is very much in the spirit of what you're doing that I think has some promise, and this is being developed, I'm involved in it, in the Deliberative Democracy Lab, which is now based uh, at the uh, our center that Frank and I both once directed on democracy development and the rule of law. And uh, in, uh, in a deliberative poll, you draw together a random sample of a public. It's been done for the European Union. I think it's been done at one time in Japan. Uh, you can't do a constitutional amendment in Mongolia now without doing it. We've done it twice in the United States, and we're about to do it again in June on democratic institutional reform in the United States. You draw a deliberative poll, uh, you, you draw a public opinion, a random sample, you uh, survey people before without them knowing anything other than um, being surveyed on the issues, and then you bring them together to deliberate with balanced briefing papers 
pro and con arguments on the issues, and an ethic, this is really crucial, of mutual listening and mutual respect uh, in a variety of small groups that people are um, broken up into to talk to one another about the various issues. We did this in 2019. It was the original American One Room on five issues, including hot button issues like immigration, healthcare, um, the economy, and so on, taxes. And um, once people get in a room deliberating with one another with some common basis of information and some common structuring uh, of the uh, discussion, uh, and with pro and con arguments, we're back to what Smart News is doing in terms of uh, alternative content. You know, people do change. It's pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. First of all, they wind up changing their views on a lot of issues. But second of all, they get out of the kind of Fox News, MSNBC foxholes and into, you know, initially pretty reluctantly, but over time, a little bit better listening to one another. And um, so the point is, I'll close with this, the technology component with the assistance of a computer scientist here, Ashish Goel, and a team of, um, of students, advanced students and so on that he has uh, at his lab uh, in the School of, uh, or the Department of Management Science and Engineering They've developed uh, an online platform for deliberation. It's a Zoom-like platform, mm. but it's got some very distinctive features. One of the features uh, that is actually very popular um, on this platform and was particularly popular with the Stanford faculty when we used this platform for the faculty to deliberate on the um, future design of the now created Door School of Sustainability. One of the features is that the platform limits everybody's individual intervention at one point to 45 seconds. People can't, and faculty really like that <laughs> uh, discipline on their peers. Um, so uh, the point is you could scale that up. Uh, and you could have uh, potentially, this is where we hope to be headed, large numbers of people deliberating, this is the key, with diverse others, not their peers who already agree with them, on a wide range of issues. So it's sort of like taking your dial mm -hmm. and going to the next level. Okay, now that you've had um, diverse sources of information, can we talk about it? Mm. Uh, and I think that's not a very technological, but it is an innovation that can make use of technology for scaling up uh, and lowering costs that I think may have a little bit of promise. Wonderful. First, um, it's wonderful to get all these um, great endorsements from the two of the greatest uh, uh, minds thinking about democracy. But I just want to mention that uh, this conference is not sponsored by Smart News, so this is a spontaneous <laughs> <laughs> endorsement from two scholars. Uh, and then I'm sure Ken has a lot of reaction to what was said, and especially I, I'd like you to focus on the issue of how to moderate, curate mm -hmm. news, and I think Smart News has some functions, yep. some hybrid kind of mechanism of combining algorithm and, and human touch. Uh, so you can talk a little bit about it. And then in that discussion, if you could integrate some of the issues that Larry particularly alluded to, the commercially viable, sustainable enterprise. How, how can smart news become that without um, filtering everything out or making it completely free? Yeah. Yeah, thank you uh, very much for the great so uh, responses and uh, so I'm so impressed. Um, the, I think maybe um, there may be three the important factors to the money this very serious issue. And the one is, of course, maybe the, the, the government level or regulation level or platform level or media level, the second one. The third, le third level is the people. And uh, maybe the, these are maybe kind of a triangle to accelerate this maybe serious issue as a maybe political division. In that sense, maybe, so um, by maybe changing the one factor, so we cannot fix the problem. In that sense, maybe all three factors need to be fixed. And uh, in that sense, maybe, and uh, I'm, I'm a 
person in a private, uh, private, uh, uh, so private company, but maybe we need a kind of regulation in that sense. But as you know, the maybe freedom of speech is a guarantee that the constitution is very hard for the government to regulate the content itself. In that sense, so we need a kind of the, the uh, maybe as maybe uh, Frank said, uh, kind of the uh, middleware or kind of the, uh, the middle company the, between the government and the private sectors. Like a, something like a, so the, and the audit company, the same. So maybe the, the accounting, the accounting, the very important. But uh, I think maybe the government doesn't check the accounting of the company by themselves. But some middle company can the man, maybe manage how they moderate. And we need a kind of the, the maybe the a kind of the sector to manage between the government and the private sectors. So, I, I, so my advisor is so. Uh, is an ex maybe Google and who uh, created um, maybe trust and safety and the moderation field at Google, and he he built a new company called Trust Lab, and uh, so such kind of so company so try to so create a kind of the uh, the middleware or platform to the to by them so so the platform can use those kind of platform to manage the moderation, because the moderation itself is very hard. It's not easy. And so recently, as you know, the Twitter so lay off the many moderators, and then the quality of the, the content so yeah is worse, getting worse. In that sense, maybe for the platforms and uh, maybe moderation is a kind of a headache. And uh, so I think maybe we need a kind of the the the, the regulation, and then does that support and enforce the those kind of platform to change their way of thinking? And then without that. Maybe I think as you know, and uh, mm, the, if the, there is no regulation, maybe the company that so doesn't have a good so moderation can get uh, more money. <laughs> it's a trade-off, but uh, it's not good. We need a minimum regulation in the sense. And then so in smart news, so uh, we have a human editorial team, and. Uh, and managed by the Stanford alumni. <laughs> and so I think maybe professional journalism is very, very important to keep under the, the, our content quality. And then the collaboration between the machines and the human is the best. That's our thought. But recently, as so I explained, so chat GDP or maybe the AI, uh, it dramatically so changed the situation. Maybe we can. So the written so chat, GDP, chat GDP is used for the making a new low quality content for the search engine optimization or something like that. But uh, I hope maybe we can use this kind of technology into the moderation as well. And so, and so second part is about the, uh, the about the maybe rally so uh, question. And uh, I think my sustainable business model is so is very important for the sustainability of the democracy in that sense. And uh, now so. The uh, smart news is so uh, the revenue itself is so uh, is created by the other business, the same as uh, the the social media company. But uh, I think maybe we need a uh, so additional the revenue stream in addition other business other business model in the future. And uh, so I, I cannot so guarantee that so as a CEO at this conference, but uh, so uh, we should think about it. And so I think maybe the, maybe. The problem of, of the maybe other business model is maybe if we can we can get so more time spent so we can get more money. That's uh, maybe the strong issue. And then so the the most of so platform so algorithm uh, try to maximize maximize the time spent. So the f most well known case is maybe YouTube. So YouTube the maybe the the highest KPI the the most important KPI is the time spent itself. And so. I think maybe, and uh, that's so, uh, and uh, the motivation to increase the time spent makes the, the, the platform to so decrease the effort to reduce the low quality content. And then in Japan, YouTube is, is used as a, uh, maybe a kind of spread machine of, for the conspiracy theory. And it's a huge problem. And uh, not, uh, not, uh, not, not just uh, YouTube, so any so platform has the same problem. But 
I think maybe, so, and, uh, uh, so this is a huge problem for democracy, and then the building stone business model is so important for platform. But at the same time, and the, the building business model for publishers and the content creators is more important. <laughs> and then, so I think, uh, so the most of, so, uh, as I said, as a news desert, and uh, maybe publishers cannot make so the revenue. But recently, as you know, the subscription model has so, uh, the great success in the New York Times or Wall Street Journal or some several the publishers. But still, and uh, there's a very a huge problem for most of the local newspapers. And uh, how to support those so the publishers and content creators is very, very critical. And once we lose this kind of so, capability by the journalists and so the news companies, so it's very hard to recover this so maybe capability as an organization. And uh, I think maybe we need to think about the kind of this uh, support, like a European countries, yeah, as a government level or something like that. Yeah, there's so many topics, so, uh, uh, so I, I want to so discuss, but maybe time is limited. And uh, I think maybe, the, thank you very much for uh, giving me a very good so, the suggestion about uh, maybe the derivative so, and uh, democracy and uh, other platform. And uh, yeah, I, I will think about it. I want to know more about it. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. I, we should probably open the floor for questions unless uh, you have additional response, comments. OK, then any questions from the audience? I'm happy to say more if no one has <laughs> any questions. What? Right, right. There's lots of different ways you could go on these issues, but I, I had one question for Larry. I guess you talk, talked about the business model being at the at least one important element, if not at the heart of the issue which is basically trading um, uh, data um, for free service and then the data is used uh, in the way that you mentioned that undermines dem democratic values. My question, I guess, is it goes to that basic uh, thing. Do you, do you think people would want to give up the free service of Facebook, Google, YouTube, um, uh, or would government be able to do that politically uh, to, give it to basically force people to give up that free service by essentially um, Restricting the use of that data by the platforms because that's what would happen if the, if the data if the data was restricted uh, They could not use that personal data then the business model would be, would be broken But so would the revenues and so would the free service is that a politically acceptable deal in America? That's a good question. Um, I don't uh, Know enough about uh, the revenue structure of the big uh, uh, social media companies to know whether we would be talking about breaking the model or breaking the companies. <laughs> there is a difference between the two. Um, it's a really interesting question. Um, Europe has gone much further than the United States uh, in terms of regulation, and um, they're still operating in Europe. So uh, I think we could go further, too. And um, people are not going to want to pay, I think, generally, uh, a great deal of money for uh, these services. Uh, but who knows? I mean, there was a time when we thought people wouldn't pay for television. You know, we're probably of a generation, right, more or less in common. And um, we got CBS, NBC, and ABC coming into our homes, and then PBS. And you know, who, who would have been willing to pay for getting broadcast television? And now most Americans do pay uh, you know, for cable television service. So um, it's, not, uh, it's not unreasonable to think that um, people would pay for access to these uh, platforms. And in some cases, the, I think the platforms are already moving toward that model. The question is, would they pay enough to make up for the lost revenue uh, that would come from 
the dislocation of the other model? I don't know the answer to that question. I think it's a very important question. Actually, economists have done these studies about how much uh, people value their privacy for, uh -huh. and it's, it's not, not very much. encouraging, right? Yeah. I mean, for a few dollars a month, they're happy to give away everything. But, <laughs> but the reason that um, the Europeans can do it is that they don't see privacy simply as another good that you can trade off against a free email account, that it's a fundamental right, and therefore, you know, they can regulate that even if people don't necessarily you know, uh, aren't willing to protect their privacy, you know, pay very much to protect it. Uh, so I think, you know, they've just got a different view of the importance of privacy as kind of constitutive of what a modern individual is. I, I want to take advantage of my position here and, and explore a couple more issues. So Frank talked about how smart news is this dialing thing, is giving back agency to users. Mm. Now, Another question is, uh, what do users need to need to know? How, how do they need to behave in user, user literacy kind of issue? Because even if they get the agency back, do they exercise the agency in a constructive way toward a healthy democracy? That's another question. So what kind of user education uh, is needed? In that yeah, regard? so that's a really interesting question. You know, this is where a lot of the behavioral economics probably will give you some insight because it turns out that people, including me, are super lazy, you know, and there's all these dials and settings about privacy and so forth that you can use as a social media user. And, you know, even for me that, you know, I, I, I pay attention to this stuff, but I just don't bother to, you know, set the settings mm -hmm. properly because, you know, I don't want to take an extra five minutes to figure out how the thing works. Or even 60 seconds. <laughs> or even 60 seconds. And so I think that you know, the way you'd have to design the systems is to make it, uh, you know, to, to put those choices in front of people, you know, front and center before they can actually start using the service. They really have to make some commitments as to how they want to see it structured. And in fact, I guess I saw that when I signed up for Smart News. Like, you have to indicate what your preferences are in terms of the kinds of news that you, you know, uh, that you see and then put those choices, you know, make them very clear uh, and user-friendly uh, mm -hmm. so that, you know, people really understand that they do have the power to change what, uh, what they see mm -hmm. because otherwise they're just going to pick the default and then we're back in the world that we're in right now. And open. Uh, microphone on there. Thanks very much. This is extremely stimulating. Um, I actually have two questions. One may be sensitive, but could be very brief, <laughs> maybe in your answer, uh, understandably so. And then second is kind of maybe for other perspectives on the panel. One is, um, have you, this is the sensitive part, have you gotten pushback from media outlets in terms of labeling their content as one side or the other of your app? Um, and wondering how you deal with that if you, if you have. And then the second is, um, is there international content on your app in terms of the coverage of the BBC or another you know, international news agency? And is that something you've considered adding in order to add maybe a third part of your swipe <laughs> at that point? Yeah. And is that a good idea, I guess, is really for the panel? So uh, that's a great question. Um, the so, so far, so we didn't, so we haven't received such, such a maybe the negative reaction from the publishers so, because I think maybe the most of, maybe in the US, so the, the maybe I think maybe stance is very, maybe uh, maybe the stance of the media is so very maybe clear, and uh, so and uh, there's no such kind of so negative reaction from the publisher, and uh, so we actually have a partnership with the BBC. And uh, so you can you can read the BBC content on smart news and the other maybe some European the publishers and uh, you can read it and uh, yeah and uh, that's also the very important so uh, maybe viewpoint because maybe in the US maybe polarization is maybe kind of the one axis but uh, the world as I said the world is not so simple <laughs> it's so complex the multiple axes and dimensions of perspective is so important that's the reason why we we 
uh, didn't say news from two sides, news from all sides. In that sense, maybe, yeah, we should improve uh, such a perspective and uh, adding a new axis to the product, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, you know, Facebook revealed that of its content moderation budget, 80% of it was being spent in the United States, which means that 20% was for the other 180 countries around the world. And anecdotally, you know, there's, there are plenty of places where these companies have actually supported, you know, Duterte in the Philippines or Modi in India, you know, by the content moderations they've taken, the decisions they've taken. And uh, we Americans just don't pay attention to that. Uh, and so I think there is a huge international problem, you know, with the way that these platforms, you know, make these decisions. We probably have to close now, but I just want to quickly ask if, uh, if there's a way for smart news to incorporate Larry's uh, derivative marks, like 45 seconds intervention kind of idea, is this something that's easy to integrate into the current smart news app? You have to think about it probably, but uh, quickly. <laughs> and that's a deliberation issue. You don't have a deliberation component. Uh -huh. But I could see how the two could be grafted together yep. in very exciting ways. Yeah. Let's start discussion. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Great place to end. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And, uh, well, please give a, a round of applause to our wonderful panel. Yeah. We'll have a 30 minute break.